Furries didn't form in a vacuum. Furries didn't just happen one day on the internet. Culturally F has danced around the history of the fandom throughout our many videos, including new chapters to a very extensive collection of thoughts full of anthro animals. In fact, you can see this in a playlist if you have some time. But one thing we haven't done on our channel yet is a summary of this history. And that's what we're here to do today. I'm your host, RK, and evolving from fanzine to fandom is culturally effed. Here on the show, we don't shy away from topics that precede the furry fandom. Whether that's film and animation that features anthro animals, rabbits and waistcoats of children's literature, or the myths, legends, and fables carried down throughout history and culture. A fandom favorite talking point is this figurine, a lion person carved from a mammoth tusk over 40,000 years ago by one of our ancient ancestors. All these examples from our past laid the groundwork for the modernization of media throughout the 20th century, culminating in films like Disney's Robin Hood, political literature like George Orwell's Animal Farm, or the subversive comic series turned into two X-rated animated films, Fritz the Cat. The furry fandom's true origin starts in the 1970s. Sci-fi conventions started to spread out and become localized, and people began to get to know their own nerd communities a little more closely. On top of other more typical topics of science fiction in books, TV, and film, people also shared bootleg anime, comics, and homegrown fan magazines, or zines, often made with primitive basement publishing using everyday photocopiers. These creators would gather writers and artists to publish these works. One such fanzine had a specific focus on anthropomorphic animals. The official tagline was the fanzine of the funny animal Liberation Front. Booty was founded in 1976 by Reed Waller and Ken Fletcher, with an explicit desire to inject funny animals with more sex and violence, inspired by the likes of Fritz the Cat. Back then, they relied on a mailing list and paying subscribers for distribution outside of conventions. Booty would publish the first issue of Omaha the Cat Dancer, which would make history as being far too obscene for some readers causing comic shops to be fined and even raided in places like Chicago, Toronto, and New Zealand. As a result of these controversies, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund was created to help support small-time creators when the man came down on their art and speech. Omaha would later be nominated for a handful of Eisner Awards. The 1980s saw a shift in the funny animal fandom. Vooty would act as a linchpin for several years before ceasing operations in 1983. But by then, Anime and adult appreciation for animation in general grew to its own fan base, with its own tangential interest groups intrigued by talking animals. Building on this foundation of zines and comics, many anthro artists found bigger platforms to write and draw for. Booty founders moved on to Rao Brazel, and artist Steve Galachi started Albedo Anthropomorphics. As basement photocopier methods became cheaper, there was a renaissance of sorts of underground publishing creating long-lasting hits such as Usagi Yojimbo, Tank Girl, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Kalachi and his ilk would be hosting regular hotel parties to share their zines and collaborate on future projects. By 1985, there were several notable hotel parties at large sci-fi cons across the US. They would screen movies like the unreleased Animalympics or animated shorts by the Warner Brothers. These parties must have been great because they kept getting bigger and bigger and spreading to more conventions as the years went by. It was at one of these parties around 1986-ish that the term furry was coined to describe the event. These were the years of the early internet as well. The personal computer was accessible through most university and college campuses, and for those who could afford it, in their own homes. Those with internet access could keep in touch with the community through online bulletin board systems, a sort of proto-forum. Furries had a big impact on the early net, and helped build and develop early chat systems as early as 1983. Text-based games led to text-based roleplay. This created the mentality that on the internet, nobody knows your dog. In 1989, prancing skill tear furry party hosts Mark Merlino and Rod O'Reilly decided they had passed a threshold, and they needed their own space. It's often remarked that they were bullied out of the sci-fi con that they were hosting their parties in, but in reality, it was nothing so violent. 
There was uneasiness, confusion, but no shots fired. It just felt like these parties had enough of their own identity to branch out. And so, in 1989, the very first furry convention was held. With a modest turnout of just 65 guests, Conference Zero was more of a test run than a full-on event. It had a dealer's room to buy comics, t-shirts, and artwork. Panels included story workshop, furry costuming, make your own tale, and a screening of Animal Olympics. It was a new dawn for furries in person and online. The 1990s brought a boom in online activity as more and more people gained access to the internet. Furry Muck was founded and was constantly needing upgrading because these old servers could only handle a limited number of participants at a time. Furry chat groups on Usenet rapidly grew as well and branched into many subgroups. Users would create descriptions or drawings of themselves as anthro animals with distinct features and use their online handle in place of their birth name, even at conventions. Though the term persona wouldn't crop up until much later, people began to identify with their personal furry avatars. Media also explodes with anthropomorphic animals, spinning off and ripping off the billion dollar TMNT franchise. But we also get things like Tailspin, The Lion King, and Gargoyles. Video games also get more high tech and introduce a new pantheon of anthros and new fan groups to fawn over them. Conventions start to spread as well to the east coast of the US and across the pond and attendance starts to be measured in the hundreds. We also see more fursuits making appearances and starting to develop defining features as creators get more adept at creating them. Of course, here on Culturally F we have a much more complete history on the development of fursuits. It's hard to pinpoint a first fursuiter, though on Wikifur it is cited as Disney animator Sean Keller in 1992. There are many other animal costumes that predate that, like Hilda the Bambioid, pictured here in 1989. Past 1995, the internet is more accessible than ever. We have art sites pop up like Fur Nation, BCL, Yurf, and a couple others. Furcadia is an early MMO for further persona development. There begins a big internal debate within the forums and chat groups of the fandom, those who treat it as a passing hobby, and those with spiritual or sexual interests that overlap, or lifestylers. A more extreme response to the more sexual elements of fandom were the Burned Furs, who for three years lobbied to clean up the fandom and separate any adult elements from the otherwise clean art. Though this movement was very elitist and homophobic and selective on who they would allow to call themselves furry in their group, ultimately leading to the movement's failure. The burn furs did not just appear from nowhere. There were legitimate worries from many people with regard to behavior and the public image of the fandom at large. Furries already have negative stereotypes associated with the fandom online, and this part of the culture leaks into the mainstream. There were also many rumors surrounding Conference 8 in 1997 regarding bad behavior and over-sexualized content at the con. Many of these claims are exaggerated and did not actually contribute to the closure of Conference several years later. But this did bring up a lot of serious issues the community would wrestle with over the next decade. With new boundaries in place in public and online spaces, and always those who push those boundaries. By the year 2000, there are nine furry conventions. Fursuiting is a staple of panel content. 1997 was the first fursuit parade, an effort to expedite the masquerade and give costumers a chance to show off their fuzz. Dances are also a mainstay at these cons. There's also a lot more queer people in the fandom at this point. Furries online take to blogging and flock to sites like LiveJournal and DeviantArt, where they can combine blogging with artwork. Yahoo Groups also replaces the dwindling chat communities of the 90s. Furries began to easily connect with others in their own locale, creating little pocket communities around the world. Many would grow into their own parties, events, conventions, even camping trips and cruises. With a bigger fandom came no central way for all furries to communicate. This became an issue with a series of really negative media depictions of the fandom, including Vanity Fair and CSI, as well as an increase in cyberbullying and attacks from trolling groups like Something Awful and 4chan. This prompted conventions to crack down on media attendance, as well as adult artwork or adult-themed panels. 
but it's very difficult for furries to combat these negative stereotypes developed by the media and exploited by bullies. The fandom art sites I mentioned before also see some problems of being slow or outdated. Many furs move to other sites to display their art and take commissions. Fur Affinity started as an experiment, but quickly elevated itself as a fandom mainstay as other art repositories shut down or were otherwise abandoned by their user base. Webcomics at this point are now a fandom favorite media. With easy distribution, the media takes off with dozens of titles in every genre. For several years, the Web Cartoonist's Choice Awards even has an anthropomorphic category. Furries produce their own tabletop RPG systems Iron Claw and World's Tree. And the Ursa Major Awards also start up to honor outstanding creators in the fandom. Furry publishing houses spring up, replacing and building upon the self-published zines of the 70s and 80s, now publishing full novels, magazines, and comics. The furry economy is in full swing by this time. Art commissions, fursuit commissions, second life avatars, and convention charities. Most conventions opt for a fursuit parade in lieu of the traditional masquerade costume contest, and instead look for other entertainment panels of comedy, talent shows, discussion, and live music. As digital cameras become increasingly affordable and start appearing on people's mobile phones, a new stereotype develops that furries have to deal with. That all furries must have a fursuit. Anthrocon moves to Pittsburgh with incentive from the Pittsburgh Tourism Board. It would become the most popular furry convention for over a decade. In 2006, an academic research team based out of the University of Waterloo begins their international anthropomorphic research project, later renamed Fur Science, to study this unusual fandom. By 2009, the fandom has grown to about 30 conventions worldwide. It's no longer a big deal to show off your geeky side with comic book movies and franchise reboots busting down the box office and cosplay taking off as an art form at bigger and bigger sci-fi, comic, and anime cons. Around 2010, furries start to show much better discretion when discussing the fandom with outsiders. This cumulative effort helps stem much of the negativity the fandom received throughout the 90s and 2000s. Over the past few years, the fandom has been shifting toward a younger demographic. Where most furries in the 90s were in their 20s, many more furries today are teens. Fur science and other data collections also note that furries are two-thirds LGBT and largely white and male. Their published studies suggest that the furry community is a healthy identity builder. Most furries have a fursona, and many these days choose for unique hybrids and dazzling graphic design characters. The media also starts to treat furry with more respect, as a quirky arts community rather than a crazed sex cult. The fursuit dance competition becomes a popular event and common at almost all furry conventions. In 2014, Midwest Fur Fest in Chicago was disrupted by a chlorine leak, sending 19 people to the hospital, a mystery some say was intentional foul play targeting the community though no formal charges have been brought to anyone by the authorities. Between 2015 and 17, more cons closed down due to bad behavior problems with attendees, tax issues with organizers, and conflicts with the new elitist Puritan movement, Alt-Furry. In 2015, Fur Affinity is purchased by IMVU, the first time a major commercial company invests money into the fandom. Later, other companies would follow suit like Amino Apps and Telegram. By the end of 2017, there are oodles of fur cons around the world, and new ones starting up in countries like South Africa, Thailand, and China, and beyond. 17 furry cons have attendance over a thousand people, and Midwest Fur Fest passed 8,000 attendees, breaking a decade-long record held by Anthrocon. Getting a hotel room at these conventions is getting harder and harder as they become more and more popular. Charity donations from across these cons total about 440,000 US dollars. The furry fandom continues to grow and mature. We continue to grow past big challenges like media representation, cyberbullying, and infighting. History shows us that whatever might come down the line, we as a community will be ready for it. Furry is not mainstream, not yet, and probably not anytime soon. Though you can find cheap fursuit heads at Walmart or Hot Topic come Halloween. There is interest in the broader fan communities in our unique subculture. Many people grow out of the fandom. 
leaving it behind as they get more adult responsibilities. Yet there are more and more young furs arriving in need of direction and a reassurance that even though we're a weird group of art nerds, we'll get through anything so long as we have each other. I can't wait to see how the fandom continues to grow and develop. It's a subversive counterculture at a time when big corporations are taking control of fan communities, whether it's comics or video games. Furries make our own media, mostly, and that's something that most big organizations just can't wrap their head around. Of course, for this episode, I had to skip over details and try to make the video brief. So please let me know down in the comment section your favorite part of furry fandom history that perhaps I skimmed over or neglected to mention entirely. Rusty will bring up some of his favorites in our next Eft update. This timeline was made possible with research carried out by fandom veteran Dronon, who hosts convention panels on fandom history, as well as an interactive webzine called 2K16 Furries created by Colin Space Twigs. This episode was inspired by Furry Nation, a new book by Joe Strike, which is a wonderfully composed oral history of the fandom by furries from all over the US. Grab it at your local bookstore or online. It isn't published by a small furry publisher. This is a mainstream book, so go support our fandom with this wonderful addition to your library. This is not a sponsored message. They did send me a reviewer's copy, but this is actually a fantastic book. I have been your host, RK. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Rusty Shacklefer, and I'm here from the future to warn you that the fursuits are taking over, and the only way to stop them, or at least slow them down, is to subscribe to Culturally F, and make sure all of your friends are subscribed too. What also helps is if you get Culturally F merchandise at culturallyf.com that certainly throws them off their game. And if you want an advanced warning, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter. It's the only thing that sees this coming. Incoming transmission! Make sure to subscribe to Culturally Up on Patreon, and then maybe you can be impregnated with the future's last hope. I have been Rusty Sacklefer. Good luck.